So our first guest this morning, morning, Mr. Kump, Larry D. Kump is in the studio with us. How are you, sir? Good morning, and for sure and for certain, may God bless you all real good. So the the um, the intro, we we're talking about issues with the uh, correction systems and getting in contraband and that sort of thing. And you have a background in corrections, do you not? I do. I worked uh, 17 years as a correctional case manager at a fairly high security prison. So I know more than I ever wanted to know about corrections. In fact, uh, there's only one other correctional, previous correctional employee in the West Virginia legislature, uh, and that is a fellow who was a correctional officer in a federal prison. What is a correctional case manager? Correctional case manager does day on day for instance, my office was right down on the tiers. Uh, we take care of the security levels. We care, take care of all the uh, uh, programming for the inmates. Uh, we make the recommendations for parole hearings. We make the recommendations as to what security level that inmates serve, serve in, which is a big deal for inmates. Uh, also, when I was a correctional officer, I worked in the evenings as a uh, group therapist uh, for sex offenders. So it was an interesting ride. Wow. Um, was that here in West Virginia? Uh, no, it was in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, the correctional institution I served in was 14 miles from my Falling Waters home. And just to tell you how much stress was involved, it was not unusual on my 15-minute drive to work to have to stop and throw up before I went to work. Oh, my goodness. What's the source of the stress? The prison, uh, the environment. It just it wasn't hard work as far as physically. Uh, there were some challenges intellectually because one of the things we had to do is research all the inmates' cr criminal history when they came in from scratch to make sure it was clean. And a lot of the work we did was looking for the detainers for the inmates to make sure. Sometimes they would come in with a three-year sentence and after we were done would end up with a 20-year sentence because of other charges we'd find. Uh, but it just was so intensely, the best way I can say it is just sucked your soul out. Mm. Bill. Yeah, uh, Larry, why did it take the our legislators and the governor over a year to really address the correctional officer problem? That's a very good question. Uh, now, let me back up a little bit. Uh, West Virginia has a terrible, terrible retention rate with correctional, not just officers, but correctional employees. There's more than correctional officers who work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, with inmates. Uh, no matter what West Virginia does, we're going to have a retention problem. We have that all over the country. For instance, Maryland pays a lot more. They have a better health care system. They have a 20-year retirement. They're still struggling. But we can and should do much better. But the question why didn't, didn't it do better, we put in legislation. It just didn't go anywhere. Uh, and finally, the governor agreed to call a special session, which was way overdue. In, for, in hiring new folks, is there a fairly severe, fairly robust psychological examination? There isn't in West Virginia. There is in Maryland. Uh, and that's one of the issues uh, that we have because you don't want to, regardless of how desperate you are for employees, you don't want somebody who is in there for the wrong reasons as a correctional employee. Um, and I think that would be one major step that would be helpful to have some kind of a psychological uh, evaluation to make sure that they are fit. And even if you do have a good psychological evaluation, it's quite a culture shock to walk into the prison system and find out what you're really dealing with. Yeah, this, I, I hearken back uh, when we're talking about corrections to a study that I believe done in Stanford University back in the 1970s. And if memory serves, I remember they, that. they took the students and divided them into two groups. Exactly. One would be prisoners, one would be correctional officers. And in a matter of a few days, the, uh, the prisoners became, the group that identified as prisoners, became very subservient. Very, they were pushed out, but they, they acted like someone that was being looked over and, and right. managed. Whereas the correctional officers just did, did, did just the opposite. They became very aggressive in the personality, and they had to cut the st uh, call the study off because there was physical abuse brewing. So. I, I'm familiar with that study. In fact, when I went through the Correctional Academy in Maryland, that was one of the case studies that, yeah. uh, that we were uh, 
had had to had to study. Uh, it, it's it's amazing. Uh, and because you're a correctional employee, you feel a lot of pressure, uh, and there's a lot of pressure to cover up for fellow employees. Uh, now, it's been helped with training and also the fact uh, cameras being put in in the prison. It, that helps. But there still is that psychological modeling that, ha that takes place uh, when you're in a position of authority. With cameras. Are the cameras uh, throughout the, the jail, or are there blind spots or, sp spots or dark spots that's not covered by the cameras? There's always blind spots. Okay. There's always blind intentionally. spots. Intentionally? Not intentionally. intentionally. But, for instance, you don't have cameras in the cells. Uh, and uh, so a lot can happen within a cell, um, and uh, it does. The recent legislation that was passed um, during the special session involves a pay increase for correctional officers, and there's also a program, I'm going to get the details wrong because I don't really understand mm -hmm. it, but th there's like a shadowing program where um, new correctional officers will essentially follow in the path of experienced correctional officers and they find out whether or not this is really good for them. Do you think that will have a positive impact? I think it will because what's happened, and what happened with me, the, the first day of hire, I was in the Correctional Academy, and it was Maryland, but this, the, the, the statistics are similar. Uh, so you spent six weeks in the Correctional Academy, uh, and you had a lot of things that were told to you and instructed about that were helpful. But then you went in the prison, and that's a whole different world and a whole different culture. Uh, and in West Virginia, going from the Correctional Academy to the prison, that's where you have a lot of burnout, a lot of dropout, and they think, oh my golly, you know, this is not what we learned. That it's different book learning than it is actual, in fact. And a lot of people say, I don't want to do this. In fact, I know one correctional officer who, um, speaking about pay, really wanted to be a correctional officer, which is unusual to me because I can't imagine anybody saying, when I grow up, I want to be a correctional officer. But this fellow really wanted to be a correctional officer. He was, he was really interested in it. After he was there about a year, he reluctantly quit because he got twice the salary working as a bread truck driver. And he says, I just, I need to take care of my family and more than preserve my career dreams. Now, Larry, we've been using the term correctional officer. You told us when we first came, when you first get, got in this morning, the guards do not like to be referred to as guards, prefer to be referred to as correctional officer. Yes, I would phrase it a little bit differently. The correctional officers do not like yeah, to be you're referred exactly. to sorry, sorry, as, you're as right, guards. You're right. yep. uh, what the feedback I've gotten, and this is kind of an insider thing, um, correctional officers are trained, they go through the academy, uh, they they say that's better than being a guard, which they look at as being something like a rent-a-cop. Do you think that's a, that the pay increase, which is significant, it's like $10,000 mm -hmm. in increase for um, the, the bottom-level correctional officers, obviously everybody wants to make more money, and uh, right. God bless them for it. You know, but, it's, right. that, but being a correctional officer, for the reasons you were just talking about earlier, I would think there's a certain amount of soul-stealing Ness in in being a correctional officer. Do you think that the the increase in pay is going to have a significant impact on uh, attraction and retaining? I'm hopeful that that it will. Uh, I told somebody the other day, and they said, "What do you think about the pay increase?" I said, "It's really good, and it's certainly better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Right. Uh, it's really helpful, but there are other issues that 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 are involved. And no matter what you do." It's still a nasty, nasty place to work. Uh, for instance, the uh, superintendent of the regional jail here in, uh, in Martinsburg, uh, and I hope that I'm not telling stories out of school because he said this publicly, uh, the pay that he makes, him and his wife live in, a, and he's the top ranking uh, official in the regional jail. Him and his wife live in an apartment above somebody's garage. Uh, so. Pay will certainly help. Uh, will it resolve all the problems? No. And I'm hopeful that the legislature moving forward will continue to address the issues. Among other things, uh, the pay increase for correctional officers was built in the pay scale. The bonus for the other correctional employees uh, was just a, you know, a one-time bonus. Uh, 
And the problem has been expressed by some, and it's truly a problem. Uh, well, if you give the increases to the other employees, let's say social workers, that's a statewide classification, and you don't want to give them for correctional reasons to all social workers. What Maryland and other states have done, and the Division of Correction can do this without legislative approval, is change those classifications. In other words, instead of having, for instance, a social worker, you have a classification of correctional social worker, uh, which does all the things that a social worker does, plus is employed by corrections. Uh, by doing that, I think we could get all the employees that are directly involved with inmates. There's 700 vacancies, I believe, uh, give or take, uh, in the correctional system, but about 300 of them are non-correctional officers who still work directly with inmates. And so we have an issue there that we think, we think needs resolved as well. Larry, you mentioned a second ago the top employee within the our jail, local jail system. I don't know what it is now, but when I was dealing more directly with them, there would be a turnover about every six months or so. And this would be at the senior level. So it's hard to keep any continuity within the ranks with that frequency turnover. Yeah, it is. Uh, one of the things that uh, they really would like, uh, all the correctional employees would like, is a 20-year retirement. Uh, that would give them something to look, look forward to. Um, but uh, there's tremendous, t for instance, the last information I had, the chaplain they have at the regional jail, or the position they have, uh, unless it's been filled recently, it's been vacant for two years. Uh, there's a lot of positions that are vacant. The case managers, sometimes they're called counselors. There's a big vacancy in that. Case managers, I know from personal experience, have a lot to do with the movement of inmates. And then also, to give corrections hierarchy, uh, management, uh, a, a little bit of, more than a little sympathy, with all the influx of inmates and all the goings and comes, they're just driving, pulling their hair out, trying to, you know, get this things managed uh, in addition to all the other concerns they have. For instance, the United States has the highest per capita incarceration rate of all the Western countries. West Virginia has the highest per capita incarceration rate of any state in the, in the nation. That's interesting. I had not heard that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, if I was in corrections top management, number one, I wouldn't want to be in corrections top management. But the pressure is just intense just to keep things together, regardless of turnover, regardless of other things. Because they're, they're, it's like musical chairs the whole time, trying to, where do we put this man, inmate? Where do we put that inmate? And then the inmates will file lawsuits because of their situation. Lots of inmates are what we call writ, writ writers. They've been in the prison system so long that they're real familiar with the court system, yeah. and they file their own lawsuits uh, pro bono. Uh, but Currently now we have another lawsuit against corrections, and it just goes with the territory. Yeah, Larry, it's, uh, it's, it's never good and it's awful risky to try to pinpoint a problem down to just one issue, and I'm not trying to do that now. Right. We hear so much, of the, uh, hear so much about the correctional officers and the shortfall. We hear less about the, the infrastructure itself. The, uh, the status of the, of the buildings. But yet that was the basis of the lawsuit in Charleston. It was the, the physical, physical building, was mm -hmm. it not? Yeah, for instance, um, among other things that I haven't read the lawsuit itself, but uh, I've read on the media that the inmates haven't had air conditioning, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of interesting to me because when I grew up, nobody had air conditioning. Yes, you're exactly right. We did not, but we have evolved in time. Exactly. I'm sitting in this office today, and I'm having trouble coping because they exactly. keep, because we we become conditioned to our, our way of life that we did not have. That's absolutely years right. Ago. Yeah. Uh, but there there is some. The, the legislature put millions and millions of, uh, of dollars in the special session for upgrading of uh, of the facilities, and that's important too. Not only for the inmates, but also for the correctional employees. Now, whether this will resolve this lawsuit that's been filed beats the heck out of me. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's always an ongoing situation because it's like, well, let's patch this. Let's fix this. Let's just make this temporary fix. And so there's always an infrastructure problem. Yeah, you know, throw this out for both of you. It, not going to be a popular question, but is it possible? We talk about the population in prisons and in in West Virginia and nationwide. Is it possible that we just have too many laws 
that we're imprisoning people that shouldn't be imprisoned? Well, my personal opinion is uh, there's two schools of thought mainly that I don't agree with either. You either put p people in prison for rehabilitation or you put them in there to punish them. My school of thought is different than those two. You put people in prison because they're too dangerous to be in society. And I think that's the only justifiable reason. We put too many in people in prison because we just don't like their lifestyle. If they're not harming somebody else, then why are we putting them in prison? Because what you have in prison is lockup welfare, three hots and a cot. You might not like the situation, you might not like the environment, but it's certainly guaranteed uh, guaranteed support of your of, of your life uh, in fact I've had inmates the other thing I had to do is do the release paperwork on inmates and I've had inmates come to me and say oh it's the winter time you know can't you delay my release until the spring and I said no when your time's up you got to go I had one inmate that was on home detention, and they thought this was wonderful. He, in fact, he was the first inmate from our prison that went to the home detention system. And after he was there for a week, he called me from home and said, I don't like this. It's really restrictive. I can't do anything. Can you bring me back to the prison, and can I have the same cellmate that I had before? And I said, no. And he said, well, what if I throw a brick through the liquor store? Will I go to the prison? I said, yes, I wouldn't recommend you do that. He said, well, if I do, can I come back to the same prison, the same cell? I said, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Larry, uh, uh, politics is going to come in, and you're going to be running for office again. I understand you may have an opponent in the primary. Yeah, Mr. Klein has prefiled uh, to be opponents of mine in the Republican primary. I did that a couple of days ago. Uh, so, of course, the real fouling doesn't happen until January. But I'm reasonably confident that he's going to, to be an opponent uh, unless something drastic happens. And I will say this about Mr. Klein. I don't know him personally, but I know of him. And of all the opponents I've had, uh, I'm really pleased that I have such a quality opponent. Uh, I think he's a man of integrity. Uh, I think he's a man of education uh, and, and quality. So I'm looking forward to a, to a, to a, the folks in our district having no choice. Of course, they should, they should choose me. Yeah. <laughs> but you said, uh, you said before we came on air that Jim was courteous enough to call you and tell you what he was planning to do. Yeah, he called me a day or two after he prefiled. Uh, he was very gracious. He said, I wanted to reach out to you, and we had a lovely conversation. Uh, uh, it just increased my impression of him as a, as a gentleman and, and a scholar because he's a university employee. Now, what would be the, you obviously will have similar similarities in some of the things you want to do. What are some of the differences difference between you and Jim? I don't know what his platform is, so I don't know what the differences yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, if he would say, I want to do just what Delegate Kump does, that would be wonderful. Uh, but I, I really don't know what his, his platform is. I'm sure I'll learn. Okay, what is your platform? Give us a chance. We get a head start on. Well, doing okay. Things. First, I'll say, and this is really important. Uh, my website is kumpwv.com, and you can make donations donations to me online. Again, kumpwv.com. <laughs> my platform, generally speaking, is integrity, accountability, and transparency. And I try to be transparent in all my votes on that. But essentially, I'm a constitutional. Uh, Republican uh, and a Christian conservative. Uh, so um, it's not really rocket science what I do. I'm for the Second Amendment. I'm for pro-life. Uh, I'm for downsizing government. One of the things that did come up, and I will mention, uh, which is a concern to, to many people, is this, I call it the uh, Rube Goldberg system we had to come up with on the personal property tax on vehicles uh, because the voters, except in Berkeley County, voted that down as a constitutional amendment, so we had to do an end run around that. So we have to clean that up. Uh, but one of the things that concerned me that people have contacted me saying, well, wait a minute, there, there are other property taxes that have gone up and they don't understand that had nothing to do with the legislature. That was done at another level of government. But people aren't tuned in to all that 
that, that fine tuning. But I'm excited about the reduction in, in the uh, personal income tax. I think for the next couple sessions, we're going to have further reductions in the personal income tax. And I think that will provide jobs and growth. And that's a big deal for Berkeley County and West Virginia. You mentioned reducing government. And that is something everyone says, regardless of then there are two years or 15 years or a neophyte just planning to run. Going to reduce government. You've been uh, three or four years in the legislature. What would you do and not just nibble away? Uh, is there any function that we're doing now in West Virginia that we could eliminate? Well, let me give you one blatant example. It's a small example, but it kind of tests the, tests the tone. Uh, to be a hairdresser. Uh, or barber you have to go to school get certified and we have a state board and commission uh, that, that handles that uh, you know if I get a bad haircut I just go to another barber uh, I think there's far too much regulation and one of the things we could do is reduce the regulation when we put in these boards to regulate things they don't want to let anything go and they want to do more regulation and more regulation I remember a couple of years ago they said, well, you know, we have to regulate even the hair washers in the beauty school. So inst instead of taking them out of that, they came up with a separate regulation for hair washers uh, in, in beauty salons. Uh, there's just too much. Reg there has to be some regulation, but I think we have far too much. West Virginia is known as being wild and wonderful, and it is wild and wonderful. I moved here in 1990 uh, as a refugee from Maryland. Uh, and I was excited about it, still am excited about it, but West Virginia still has a whole lot of centralization of government that started back when we amended the Constitution in 32 when things were really bad and people said, we don't know what to do, and the government says, we'll take care of it. For instance, that's how we got rid of our county roads and why we have only state roads now. I didn't know we didn't have county roads. Oh, no. Yeah, Larry's exactly right. Uh, and it's because the Depression mentality at the time felt that it'd be one function better centralized and so we are one of the most centralized states in the union and but i i also and i've said this before uh i also take some exception with the attitude for many of our legislators they chafe about legislation or regulations coming down from dc but they're not prepared to delegate those same functions down to the county level. They want to keep as much as they can vested in Charleston, and I think that's a mistake. Yeah, you've been singing that tune for quite a while. Have, You're consistent. Yeah. yeah. You're consistent. Uh, and if there was not hypocrisy involved, it wouldn't bother me as much. But the hypocrisy is, and I'm not pointing at you, I'm not pointing right, at any right. particular uh, uh, delegate or uh, legislator, but they, they take great umbrage that there's an overreach in from Washington, but they're not prepared to recognize there's an overreach from Charleston. One issue that's kind of tangential to that, that's a pet peeve of mine, and I've been doing what I can to get attention to it, is the unfunded liabilities that the state puts on the counties, for instance, the regional jails. Essentially, they're state employees, but the county has to, has to, has to pay for them. I think the state should pick up that tab. I know that's more money paid out by the state, but the county should not have to pay for that function. Delegate Larry Kump, thank you so much for coming in this morning and enduring with a sport coat, no less, the uh, <laughs> 95 degree studio heat.